now. I'm Thomas Cox, and I am your host for IMCNOW, that is the Pacific Northwest Oregon and Washington chapter of the Institute of Management Consultants. This is our monthly chapter meeting, uh, usually starting at 3 p.m., 3.30 p.m. Pacific time for networking, and then at the top of the hour at 4 p.m., we start our regular program. Next month, I want to mention, is going to be an exception. Next month only, September, the uh, program will start at 7 a.m., because we have one and only one speaker, Judy Reese, one of the original authors of the book Clean Language, is coming to us live from the United Kingdom. And she wasn't willing to stay up past midnight to accommodate our normal time, so we're starting early to accommodate hers. Uh, and believe me, it'll be worth it to get up at that hour to uh, talk clean language with her. Fascinating material. But that's not today's topic. Today's topic is business models and the business model canvas and business models for consulting. And before we get started with presentations, I'd like to ask our president, Chuck Roxon, to say a few presidential words to us. Well, Chuck. I'd like to welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we're going to be talking about two kinds of business models. First, a little bit about the business model of our professional association. What kinds of questions might we want to ask? Uh, as we pursue getting value from our association. And, and then we're going to have a talk about our individual business models uh, and how we can um, uh, manage successfully uh, our, our practices to give value to our customers, however we define them and however they define themselves to us. So let's just jump right into it. We have a lot to cover. Brilliant. Uh, Diane, you ready to go? I am ready to go. Super. Our first, uh, the shorter of the two presentations today is by Diane Gibson, who is also on our board. And Diane's going to talk to us about the business model of the Institute of Management Consultants as seen through our eyes as members. And she may have gathered more information since I last heard from her about this. Uh, Diane, do you want to share your screen or do you want me to share uh, mine? Oh, actually, if you can share yours with the PowerPoint. I don't have your PowerPoint. All I have is oh. the Miro board. Oh, okay. Uh, hold that. Hold on just one moment. And I'm hoping that everyone who got invited also got the, the nudge to look into the business model canvas just a little bit in advance. If not, you're in for a bit of a uh, fire hose of information. The business model canvas is uh, a fascinating way to look at businesses and it does take a little getting used to. So if you're not already familiar, you'll you'll see some very interesting new material. Okay, just bear with me here. Oh, and I'm gonna remind everyone to go ahead and mute yourselves. And unless you know for sure you have no infants and no dogs. Okay, and let me get to the share screen. Love this part of the technology. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. And thank you for your patience. So as Tom mentioned, and Chuck mentioned today, we are talking about business models. And uh, the question is, has for, for looking at either your own or the Institute of Management Consultants or any other business model that you're working with, has the vision and value exceeded its shelf life? If so, it might be time to hit the refresh button. Um, so since we started this conversation about having this presentation today, I've been listening to the words, listening for the words business model. And in our breakout session, I was asking one of our group attendees, Manoj Garj, uh, about his own business model. And he said, how do you define a business model? 
and we'll get to that in just a moment. But what I wanted to say is in listening to uh, the news, in reading online, in hearing an, an OPB uh, interview just yesterday, people in organizations, people as individuals, uh, people in nonprofits, all types of businesses are doing some sort of change to their business model. The, the, the segment that I heard on OPB yesterday was about the woman that manages a, a nonprofit organization for deaf and blind individuals in the Seattle area. And she basically turned the business model on its head um, and required uh, less use of American Sign Language, which for deaf and blind people was quite a challenge. Anyway, it was a fascinating example of somebody challenging the status quo for reasons of either growth or to stay ahead of change, to enhance members, uh, to provide a new value to members. So it's uh, fascinating to hear the term business model and again, to say, okay, how do you define a business model? And you've all probably had some experience, whether uh, as a consumer or a member or as a provider of some value in your own business about what type of business model you will use or you've determined is best to suit your business. So um, the one I dislike the most is only because of oil can Henry's uh, bundling. You go in for an oil change and pretty soon it's $125 when it was supposed to be $49.95 or something because they've added, and I've agreed to, windshield washer fluid, wipers, a new filter, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm sure you're all familiar with different models. But what is a business model? So back in 94, Peter Drucker, uh, the father of American management and the, uh, basically the creator of management by objectives, had a conversation. This was from a, a, a Harvard Business Review article. But he was having a conversation and someone said, what is a business model? You can read this. It's assumptions about what a company gets paid for. However, he never really specifically mentioned the term business model. So 2012, along comes Alex Oster Osterwalder, pardon if I've mispronounced that, and he builds on Drucker's assumptions and comes up with Business Model U, a book uh, that contains the business model canvas. And one of our uh, esteemed IMC members, uh, Bruce Hazen, contributed to that book. Um, and so he, the, the purpose of the business model canvas as Osterwalder, Osterwalder presented it was to challenge the assumptions that one has about their business model, whether that's the key strengths or key resources or your value proposition. And speaking of value, one of the things that we all understand is about a business model is what is the value provided to us? Speaking of IMC, what is the value of IMC to all of you that are attending this conversation today? Is it because of the significance of the organization? Is it for the camaraderie? Is it for the professional education or certified management consultant status? There are many different value streams that IMC USA provides. And there's a whole team of people that have been working on modifying the IMC USA model, um, the whole team of people. And perhaps some of you in the audience have been board members or our CMCs, you, you've all contributed in some way to the business model that we have today. But speaking of value, uh, 
This is an extract from the Consultancy Navigator book uh, by Jerry Vieira. This is not a plug for Jerry Vieira, but I have, as I look at my own business model and have, be, have been reviewing the value that I provide as a consultant, I went back to the book because of this value statement. And it's basically saying that these factors of economic, emotional, physical, political, and social are important components to keep in mind in terms of the value that we provide. <clears throat> and I'll go back to the business model canvas to show that these are the nine components or building blocks that are present in that template. Again, you can, you can read this, but partners, activities, value proposition, proposition singular, or if you've got multiple value propositions, um, to a value proposition for each of the different constituents that you might serve, um, the customer relationships that you have, seg customer segments, key resources, what are the things that have to be in place in order for you to provide value to your client? What are the marketing channels? How are you reaching people? We talked a little bit about that in our uh, our um, networking segment about the, the online tools that we're using to connect with our customers or our clients. And it could be as simple as a camera and a computer. It could be on site. It could be all the uh, platforms that are available now for um, conducting business online, Miro or Microsoft Teams among a couple that were mentioned. Um, what is the cost structure and the revenue streams of your business? This is, I should have enlarged this. Uh, this is the business model canvas. If you have never seen this before, um, can you see that? Okay. Uh, so this is the, the business model canvas. Again, you can see the nine building blocks that are present. This model is from the group called Strategizer. That's Strategizer with a G-Y-Z-E-R. And that is um, the, the creators and contributors to business model U and the business model canvas have a host of resources available on that website for free, or you can sign up for very extensive um, classes in terms of how to use the business model canvas. So as uh, an IMC member, uh, a re recently renewed IMC member, uh, the information that I found fascinating was that professional associations and their model haven't changed all that much in about a hundred years. And the key in this conversation about business models and why we're all here today is to really give some thought to all the things that have changed in the work environment, in organizations, in our geography, just thinking about the gig network and how that's impacted organizations and their employees or no employees, um, how technology has also influenced our environment and what we provide to our clients or customers. So IMC is a 53-year-old professional association and has been evolving. I mentioned earlier that a number of people, um, again, on this call or those that, that, um, that may not be able to be here today have been board members or board chairs, uh, chapter leaders, people that have had an opportunity and a part of this evolution of IMC. Our current president, uh, Julia Demkowski, has in the last two newsletters presented information about how and what initiatives have progressed in, uh, in light of this whole conversation about 
what's the value that IMC USA provides to members? And are we meeting the needs of our members? Um, and she's, she's given some great updates on those initiatives. So let's jump to the business model. And this is, um, I really trust you can see this and that it's a large enough view. Um, I'm on a very small tablet. So. I think it looks pretty good. Okay. I just don't wanna make it too large so that it is obscured off the screen. So basically, um, and this was, this was my Miro training to Jeff <laughs> Oltman, um, <laughs> who in the last IMC uh, speaker series introduced uh, Miro and a host of other online tools. So, ah, buggers, excuse me. So I won't have time to go through all of this, especially uh, in a Miro format, but suffice it to say that again, as I was looking at my own business model, I'm looking at IMC USA. And so who are our key partners and suppliers? Members, CMCs. I tried to color code it so that as we move across the canvas, you can see some, um, some relationship there. Um, educational institutions and students. There's a, I mean, we have uh, Frank Coker and uh, Dr. I believe it's Blaney uh, that are working with the University of Washington and students. So that's another, to me, that's another different constituent with a different need than perhaps what the overall IMC USA provides. I don't know. Um, communities, nonprofits, other professional associations. I just yesterday, or excuse me, on Sunday, had a conversation with a colleague about the, um, the PMI Institute, uh, Project Management Institute, and asked about how they would go about providing so much online content and information to their members. And she said, it's, we do something once a week. She's no longer a member, but was about two years ago. Um, we were doing, they were doing online sessions once a week. They were doing uh, monthly meetings. They were doing webinars. They were doing annual events. So it takes a lot of membership um, contribution and a lot of membership involvement, plus the board and IMC National to keep these things going. And, uh, and, and the, our involvement in that is key. So as we look at our own business models, how are we also contributing to the IMC USA model? And, and again, these are just my uh, perspectives here. This is not something that I've um, shared other than with Chuck and Tom. Uh, so it may or may not be right, but it at least prompts the conversation, perhaps amongst chapters or um, a special interest group to say, hey, what, what are we doing? And again, I know that Julia and her team are working on a lot of this. Um, key activities, professional development. We say that we're an organization that provides um, not only education, but professional advancement, professional development to management consultants. And what, do, what does IMC USA have to have to produce that or to provide that? Industry leaders, people that can talk about pertinent topics, um, uh, valuable content that is going to help people advance either in their thinking or their professional growth. Uh, we also have to have uh, national chapter um, members or chapter, excuse me, national chapters and their websites to provide and enhance and communicate the information to all of our members. Um, I just want to make sure I'm checking my time here. Yeah, if you can wrap up. Yeah, I think so. I've got like one second here. Um, anyway, this model is 
this is basically what I've used the business model canvas to help me think about IMC USA. And I would um, invite you all to look at that. Um, the remaining slides are basically the questions that are provided uh, on the business model canvas. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chuck Roxon, who's going to talk about the business models that we might be able to use as consultants with our clients and in other situations. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Diane. Thank you, Diane. <clears throat> and the uh, the canvas is something we'll be coming back to frequently. Uh, not necessarily today, but over time, I know because it's a it's a handy tool. Well. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, my name is Chuck Roxon, and um, I started my consulting firm in uh, 1983, and uh, it's still going, and I, I have several of them. Uh, and I have had to change my business model of how I deliver services to whom and how um, a number of times uh, over the uh, decades. Uh, you know, Minaj was talking during the uh, pre-session about technology, and I vividly remember in graduate school, uh, we were required in the program I was in to learn to program in Fortran and COBOL. And um, the uh, most powerful computer available at that time was the uh, University City Science Center uh, in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, basically it was a 360 by 360 grid, uh, which anybody with an Excel <laughs> spreadsheet can now do what we had to have the most powerful computer in the United States to do back then. Um, so things change and they, they change in many ways uh, that we're very often not aware of. And no matter how many years I've been in business, how old I am, um, I still have to be ready to be agile, so to speak. And this has been true for a long time. Okay. So changing business models, it's a major challenge in the consulting profession. If I were to divide myself up, there's four of me. There's Roxon Solutions, which is one of my um, deliverables. There's the Futures Group, which says here, call us when the world moves faster than your strategy. And that's what we do. We try to anticipate the future. The business advisor is for new or growing companies. A well-managed company is a good investment. It was when I started the company and it still is. And Global Health News Network is exactly what it says. We uh, prepare uh, information about health uh, globally and we have close relationships with um, uh, a number of uh, global organizations. I wanna talk a little bit about the history of our profession. Uh, first of all, uh, it really begins with Frederick Taylor and scientific management in the 1880s. That's time motion studies. Uh, and uh, when I was first consulting, my first paying job was indeed measuring people with a stopwatch uh, and providing information about it. Uh, it was an essential part of consulting at that time when you were called into a company to help improve their efficiency and profitability. We normally think of consulting as beginning <laughs> when Mr. McKinsey, a professor, uh, started McKinsey and Company, he was a management accountant. And uh, what he did basically was he didn't do, he didn't do the books. He analyzed in dollar terms um, how the company was performing. And uh, we still have a management accounting profession. Uh, people get certified as a management accountant. And McKinsey really began at a university consulting to companies. And he expanded 
from Chicago to San Francisco and New York at first, uh, a key date. Another key date in the development of our profession really came in 1945. Anybody involved in organizational development, organizational communication, employee well-being, and any of that, this comes straight out of the Cornell University School of Industrial and Labor Relations, which began right after World War II. Gene McKelvey um, was one of the lead faculty and one of the first uh, labor arbitrators uh, in the world, actually. 1947 was another hallmark year. The psychologist Irving Janis began teaching at Yale and he introduced for the first time the concept of morale into business from his experience in studying the morale of soldiers uh, on the Western Front in the European theater of operations in the Second World War. And as many of you know, the question of morale, particularly during the Battle of the Bulge, was a very serious one, as there were tens of thousands of soldiers who were just unable to emotionally to fight. <clears throat> so we have an evolution of models in the profession that we've been exposed to. The first is industrial engineering. University-based is still a very strong model. And one of the things about university-based is people come to you. Uh, I was affiliated for a number of years, not only with the Cornell ILR School, but also with the Rochester Institute of Technology. And I have to say, I got spoiled. We never had to do any marketing. Um, captains of industry would call us up and they would say, can you help us with this? And we would say, but of course, even if we'd never heard of it, we'd figure out how to do it. Um, uh, the other thing about being university-based is um, when software, uh, well, like Visio first came out, we were called by the people who figured it out in Washington State. They called us in Rochester, New York, and said, can you guys test this for us? And we would say, I have no idea what it does, but, but of course. Uh, so being university-based is, is still an important part of the profession. Now, this is what happened. Blue chip firms came to McKinsey. And it very quickly in the 1920s became, you want to be like GM? Contact McKinsey. They'll tell you how. They know the secrets. Uh, and uh, there's a certain, certain truth in that. Small and medium-sized customers then decided that they wanted a consultant too. And McKinsey did not bother with them. And that, to a certain extent, is when the business model for us got created in the 1930s was when smaller companies said, well, we went in on this too. And who are we going to go to? They started by going to other universities. Uh, and eventually, they would also go to people who had retired from a large company and could provide technical assistance to them. But it was a very exciting time. By 1955, it was actually standard. Most medium size and larger companies had, a, had an accounting company, a law firm, and a management consultant generalist. It was standard for so many companies. Uh, and uh, you could go into a company and make a cold call in 1980 and say, uh, I'm a management consultant. I'd like to bid for your, for your services. And they would know exactly what you were talking about. And of course, IT uh, services exploded after 2001. Actually, after the tech bubble burst is when all of a sudden people went out there and started offering their services as, as IT companies and to say, uh, your internal guys missed it. Um, let us help you with all this in the, in, uh, the future. 
Now, there are a number of different modes uh, and models of providing services. The first is a generalist, and this used to be very common in the 60s, where a company would call up some, a firm and they would say, well, we need somebody who can advise us and help us with everything. And um, being a generalist was, was very popular for a long time. But a lot of people actually are not entirely aware of what it means if you are actually a generalist deeply embedded with a client. Let me give you a quick example. Um, so I was sent down to Houston by a client uh, that was a, uh, a global 500 engineering uh, and manufacturing company to work with the VP of their oil and gas division. And I was told he might have some difficulties. So I talked with him and we were getting ready to talk about operational efficiency and all the rest of it. And then he started talking. I said, Are you, everything okay with you? And he started talking about issues conflicts he was having with co-workers, conflicts he was having with his wife, conflicts he was having with his teenagers. And I said, hang on just a minute. And I got on the phone and we had at that time uh, on our staff. That's good. Nice. I called Judy and told her we're going to Podmas. Yeah, Suzanne, you need to meet yourself. On Wednesday. Wait just a second, sweetie. Is there a problem? Uh, we just needed someone to mute themselves, but I. Okay. I use my godlike powers to mute them, and I'm not Great. afraid to Thank do it. Thank you very others. much. Uh, anyway, to finish the story very quickly, I called our full time online licensed clinical psychologist, Dr. Sue, and I said, <laughs> I said to her, Can you get down to Houston in time for dinner tonight? And uh, I'll tell you why uh, when you get here. And she did. That's what being a generalist means. It means you do everything uh, if you have a client in need. And that's where your value added comes in. Um, and you can charge a lot for that kind of value added. Uh, anyway, then we also have vertical specific. I never did a lot of work on oil and gas. I was vertical agnostic for a lot of years. I'm now mostly healthcare. I'm much more vertical specific now for a lot of reasons. Then there's, of course, are you function specific? Do you do marketing, finance, operations, et cetera? If you're a generalist, you have to promise you're going to do everything. My company now, we do strategy, operations, governance. If somebody says, do you do marketing? I say no, but I know some good people who do marketing. McKinsey does advisement, research, and they don't provide services. Boston Consulting Group, advisement, research, and sometimes they'll do the marketing services for you. But which of these three do you do? There used to be a big argument in the IMC back in the 90s that if you provided services, you weren't a consultant. If you advised or did research, you were a consultant. But if you were a pair of hands that diminished your value, hearing this at a conference had a very profound impression on me because my attitude was, whatever you need, I'll do it. I really needed, <laughs> frankly, I, I, I needed the jobs. I needed the money. Occasionally, I still provide services, but I don't provide services as much as I used to. Are you a single shingle, single provider, a professional company, or a network provider? Well, once again, I've had to change my model. I started out here. When we incorporated, we employed a lot of people. Uh, one time I had 10 full-time professionals deployed here and there. Um, or are you a network provider? Well, um, after 2001, I went from being a professional company to being a network provider. 
because I just was not interested anymore in either traveling as much as I was or in managing a whole bunch of people. And it was at, by the time I stopped, it was more than 10. So where are you? And this has an enormous impact on what services you can uh, provide. And my father, who was a successful businessman, told me, Chuck, the way to make a lot of money is not to do the work yourself, but to have other people do it and you take the profit off the top. And he was right. The most money I made in terms of a business model for my company is when we were a professional company. Then there, of course, is the question of geography. Are you local, regional, national, international? I started out local. And when I became regional, I was very excited. Uh, and when I became national, I was very excited. Uh, and this all happened by accident. I didn't become international by deciding to become international. And now for the most part, I'm not regional, I'm not national, I'm local and international. And I've maintained this only because everybody's been working online now. So the client doesn't care. The client in India or in England or in France doesn't care where I am as long as I can get on the call um, at the appropriate time and do the work. So the regional and national, they're gone. So where are where is any company here and where do they have to change? Now, I had a discussion yesterday with somebody who was just starting his consultancy and going over this with him, um, clarified a lot for him and made it a lot easier for him to decide what to do. Where are you, I said, on this spectrum for each of these? Just draw a line so you know, what you, so you know where you're at coming out of the starting gate and you can talk honestly with your potential clients. I do this, I don't do that. There's something else which is also very important here. Where in the stage of growth do you work with companies? Where are you going to make the most money? Do you do startup work? I've done some startup work. Most consultants, and that's why from the night from 1955 to 2000, most consultants were working here in the stable and growing segment. It's somewhat predictable and it's nice. I'm gonna show you a website in a minute from a company that is doing very well. They're located in North Carolina. They're getting pretty big now. Um, and they focus right here. They don't do startups. Dealing with declining companies and turnarounds, uh, most consultants don't like to deal with declining companies and turnarounds. It's very stressful. As a matter of fact, the average turnaround lasts two years. And be time, by the time the turnaround artist is done, everybody there hates them, even if the company has been saved and they're now profitable. It's really quite stressful. And then, of course, there's harvesting. And harvesting is when you have a client that says, we have to close this plant. And uh, because I started out as a generalist, uh, our firm was hired to do turnarounds. I've done four turnarounds in my career and they were indeed stressful. Um, uh, one thing about a turnaround that I like though, I get in front of a bunch of, of clients and I say, oh, you should do Six Sigma. And they say, why? And I'll say it works. So I did a turnaround uh, at a company that was making parts for a, um, a local airplane manufacturer here. And um, we got to Six Sigma. I said, God damn it, I have to do it. I have to prove I can actually do it. And um, uh, it, was, it was a very difficult, but it was a good experience for me to go through to say, I don't just talk about it, I can actually do it. Harvesting is really the worst of all. 
And uh, there are some people who specialize at it. I tried it and I realized that it wasn't gonna work for me. And uh, let me explain why. I was working for a company that was deciding which plants to keep open and which to close. And uh, they were gonna keep open the ones that had the best quality rating and the best service. And <clears throat> the plant that I was working with, uh, even though they were doing very well, uh, they just weren't doing as well as the plant in um, Helsinki. So the company decided they were going to close the plant and they picked a terrible time to close it. This is a primarily Catholic city in a Catholic neighborhood with lots of restaurants and churches. The plant took up a huge amount of space, 6,000 people working there. And on Maundy Thursday, the company announced that the plant was closing and everybody needed to come in on Good Friday to get all their stuff. I could not believe that they did this. It was the height of corporate insensitivity. I'm not Catholic, but that's beside the point. So I, um, at four o'clock, the heat went off. It was the middle of winter. It's up in the Northeast. The heat went off, the electricity went off uh, right then. And I told everybody uh, that I would meet with them at such and such a bar if they wanted to in shifts, come in half an hour, and we would um, continue to talk about all this. So I'm gonna finish up the story about why I don't do harvesting anymore. Before I went that day, I took a bottle of um, whiskey, I emptied it and I filled it with apple juice. And I got a squirt gun that looked like a 45 automatic and I filled it with apple juice. And I took this to the party house where we were gonna have the wake. And I sat down in front of everybody and I started to tell them how upset I was, how angry I was. I opened the bottle and I started to chug it. And I took out the squirt gun, put it on the table in front of me. And I said, I'm really not sure I can go home tonight and tell the family what's happened. Things have just not been good the last couple of years. Now, when I started talking, they should have remembered that I was a consultant to the company. I wasn't an employee but I was, I was there and I was talking and I had their attention. So finally, one guy up front said, wait a minute, you can't be really drinking whiskey. You'd be on the, you'd be on the floor by now if you were doing it. And I said, it's true, it's apple juice and um, it's not a real gun. There's apple juice inside the squirt gun. I'm really not gonna shoot myself. Everybody relaxed a great deal. It was, I, I did this four times that evening from, from four in the afternoon until midnight. Then I went home and the family said, where were you? <laughs> so I said, it might go long. That's harvesting at its worst. And I never did that again. Turnarounds, selective on. Stable and growth. I tell you, after a decade, this can get boring. So for me, the business model I like is working with dramatic challenge, which is startups and development and growth and turnarounds. Um, my biggest client right now is getting ready to quintuple their size. So it's important to know what you like to do here. When my kids were young, and everybody was in high school or before high school even, stable and growth is what I wanted. So when I said to them, I'll pick you up from soccer at five o'clock, it was the truth. After they started to get older, I was able to do other things. Whoops. Okay, now the sectors that you work with are also important. I actually began my work in the not-for-profit and public sector, uh, and then did work in the private sector. 
Most consultants tend not to look at special authorities, Bonneville Power Authority, the um, Seattle Port Authority, and that's because special authorities are very unique in their setup. And if you know the universal commercial code, well, you can work with private companies in any industrial company, but special authorities work in completely different legal environments. And um, uh, this is usually very special. One of our IMC members of the family located down in the Medford Ashland area has almost a lock, almost a monopoly on providing certain technical services to all the Alaska tribal corporations. And I'll show you their website in a, in a minute. So it's important to know of these three, not-for-profit, public, and private. I've worked in all three sectors. I've consulted to all three sectors. They're all very different. You need to know where you're most comfortable. Um, so uh, in terms of changing, one of the reasons that I moved from Western New York out here to Puget Sound is because the private manufacturing sector that I was working with so much in the Great Lakes area collapsed within two years. I mean, completely collapsed within two years. And I had spent time uh, on freighters in the Pacific and I'd sailed in and out of uh, Harbor Island here in Seattle. And I said to myself, well, when I grow up and get older someday, I'd like to move to, to Seattle. So when this collapsed, I said, now's the time. And I laid everybody off my own company. I moved out here. Uh, that was uh, 2001. And I just rebuilt everything from scratch. Um, so just never know. I don't do any public sector work right now. I do a little bit of not-for-profit. And I've advised the Port of Seattle on some items. And I'm teaching courses on this thing right here, right now. OK. Well, let's take a look at, yeah, I've got a little bit of time left. Let's take a look at what some companies are doing. Here's Slidebooks Consulting. They're a strategy consulting company. They have a very interesting model. Uh, they'll consult to you on strategy, but they have tools that you can use yourself if you're a medium or large size company to develop your capabilities and do all this stuff. Here's their toolkit. They have templates. They have tutorials. Their templates are actually pretty good. They start at about $800 and go up to around $2,000. So this is these are not for small companies. Um, but they have a lot of tools, really excellent materials that you can buy from them. And if you get lost and need help, you can hire one of their consultants to come in and set you straight. This is unique. Most consulting companies don't do this. They don't have their daily price right on their website. There it is, $3,000 a day. There's more than just three lead consultants. This is a screenshot, whoops. Ah. That's a screenshot. Now I, I've lost this other page I can't get back to. Um, actually, I can. I can get rid of that there. Go back to here. Anyway, there's, um, there's about six of these guys. Nope, won't let me do it. Okay. Let me talk about other two very, very quickly. Um, this is a classic consulting company, Clarkson. They're located in North Carolina. Here are their services, data analytics, quality, digital tech consulting, sales and marketing. Here's what they do. And here's the industries that they serve. 
It's not no. showing. We're not yep. getting the Chuck. If, if there's a pop up, it's not visible. Oh, it's not. Oh, okay. That's a shame. Well, go to their website by all means and um, uh, take a look. I'm sorry, that's not visible. Okay. I put the direct link to their organization in the chat. That's right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would have had to have uh, redone that. And ACLAC Accounting and Consulting, exclusively for Alaska villages, tribes, and cities. And um, uh, you're going to get a copy of this. So please, by all means, um, check out their website. Because once again, they're extremely specific and focused in what they do. And here, once again, we have a business model canvas. Now, this, by the way, this was not prepared by Uber. This is just an example. And once again, you can look at it. So by all means, please do look at this. And this is a really good example. In my business advisor company, all new companies that are just starting up are required by the third week to do the business model canvas and submit it, submit it to me for review. Um, I don't necessarily approve it, but I find out if there are some things that don't look good. And this is a lot easier for people than doing a 20 page business plan. Now, sometimes they still want to do a full business plan, but this can get them going. My, my goal with people that are starting a business is that within 12 weeks, they're up and running. They may not, they may not have revenue yet, but their, their business is for real. And I find that doing this about week three, it's a fabulous tool. And Diane began with it and I'm ending with it because it really helps people get going. Uh, and I do it myself whenever I'm doing a new project. Okay, Q&A, please, for both of us. All righty. Uh, if folks want to use the raise your hand tool in, in Zoom down around, what's it called? Reactions, I think. Uh, there should be a reactions button. And one of those is a raised hand. Eileen, Aileen? I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name. Eileen. Got it, Eileen. Sure. It means that I have all of your resumes. I have all 15 of your resumes handy. And when somebody calls up and says, um, I need help with X, and I say, oh, you know what? Rudy Mick is really good at that. Let me contact him and see if he's even vaguely interested in working with his client. Or somebody says, we need training on how to use technology better when we're doing presentations and we want them to be more interactive. Jeff, are you available? You know, the client is yours. I wouldn't attempt to do it. That's what the network thing means. And frankly, as a business model, I really believe that the IMC underutilizes it. I would love to see the Northwest chapter have a much more structured um, means of referring to each other. Yeah, some of us overlap a little bit. I can facilitate a strategic board retreat, but what if I don't want to anymore? I'm over 75, good grief. Maybe I just want to sit around and read a mystery novel or something and Victoria is available, you know? So thanks for the question. Anyway, Rudy's in favor of our doing that networking more formally. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you, uh, Eileen. Who else has a question? Looks like John Tracy's up. John, your question, sir. So much a question, just an observation, Chuck. <clears throat> uh, when I was in the chapter level for a whole lot of years, we 
formed um, a good working knowledge of each other's ability by introducing ourselves uh, and, and, and giving examples of work we've done. The result was, is that when some of us would get calls, we would know exactly who to give yes, a call I to. I can't hear you. Yeah, can you lean a little closer in, John, and, and re yes, I say, say it again, but from the diaphragm, if you will. Is that any better? A bit. Okay. Uh, back in a, ch in a chapter period, we used to introduce ourselves and make it clear what we thought our strengths were, et cetera. The result was, is that we also posted an internal document with a kind of a resume. And that became a source for doing what you are, you are talking about, Chuck, which is, I know somebody who can do this and I know who they are and I have heard the stories of what they've done and I can with confidence say, yes, here's a person I can recommend. Well, I think, I think we should do that. I, uh... I know perfectly well also that we could feel the team that could compete very effectively with some of the regional offices of major players in Seattle, for example. We have the talent. Thank you, Chuck, and thank you, John. Other questions? Anybody who can't find the raise hand function but still would like to ask, please chime in. Ah, Victoria. Hi, sorry, it took a moment for it to unmute me. So I just want to say hello from Canada. <laughs> um, I'm um, really, really pleased to see you guys using the business model canvas in this way. I have been using this to teach my, uh, my students for over a decade. Um, I use it all the time in consulting. So I just want to say how excited I am to see this getting more airtime. And uh, I happen to be um, president of the board of arts. I work in the arts and the nonprofit sector. Yes, I know my sector and my, you know, pretty well. And um, we're in the process of actually taking a look at how we can make our association stronger. And I just want to thank you. I did not think that this was going to be a conversation about associations today, but I have learned some stuff. And I just want to say on behalf of management consultants for arts organizations in Canada, thank you. Where in Canada are you? I'm in Ottawa. I don't work with the government. It's okay. No, that's, that's okay. I have relatives who from the uh, uh, Ottawa area. Do you really? Uh, yeah. And Toronto used to be my fourth largest market. Well, I'm originally from Toronto, moved here to work with Canada's National Arts Centre, which is basically our Kennedy Centre equivalent. I worked there for 20 years and I've worked with lots of smaller organizations and that's who I really serve most of the time and I work in both English and French. Anyway, it's uh, <laughs> nice to meet you Very and I cool. just want to say thank you. This is great. And I'm really vindicated. I launched the first arts management training program in Canada's maritime provinces a year ago. And our capstone project is a business model canvas. And I got to tell you, you made me feel really good today. So thank oh, you. Super, super, super. <laughs> By way of full disclosure, I should mention that I actually began as a conservatory graduate. Okay, file in. All right, who else has a question? Yes, uh, Maurice. Mr. Go Maurice on. Fuller is up. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, let Maurice. me unmute myself. Perfect. Uh, hey, great presentation, Chuck. I, I enjoyed this very much. I want to ask you about your slide on major generic models, uh, point number four. Where you talked about advisement, research, and provision of services, and um, how those were not, they were sort of like mutually exclusive. And if you provided one or the other, then you weren't really considered a service. Can you so kind of go over that again? No. A little bit yeah, more depth. Sure. I couldn't quite follow what you were saying there. Okay. So so, I think it's interesting because I'm providing actually all three as part of a new business model I'm forming. Well, I provide all three too. So here's here's how it here's how it goes. I advise a client that they need to be compliant with GDPR in Europe because they do healthcare there. Okay. Then I do some research for them on who else that they compete with that's GDPR compliant. Then they say to me, we don't have the bandwidth to do it. Can you do it for us? 
Mm. So I ended up doing all three. Some consultants believe that it gets your hands, when you get your hands dirty, you're dirty, you're not a consultant. Mm. Okay, that comes from every Jack and Jill who does coding, calling themselves a consultant. Mm. Now, if somebody is an interim chief technology officer, which I think is a critical role for many companies, mm. you're, you're in, man, that's it. But so where do you draw the line? And um, uh, that's all that that's about. I do all three, but if somebody were to say to me, um, can you write this memo for a press release? I would say, no, that goes to your PR company or your PR professional. Okay, got it. Okay, thanks for clarifying. That's great. Sure enough. And before we take our next question uh, from Jerry Fletcher, I'm gonna note that it is just a minute past the top of the hour and I am a stickler for ending the recording on time, although the meeting may continue. And so I'm gonna thank everyone who's watching the recording and thank everyone who came here live and let you know we're here every month, IMC, NOW, and thanks for being a part of it.